All right, good morning. And we will try to talk about um, the last section in this chapter, chapter four, 4.9, antiderivatives. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, share my notes with you first. So um, the whole section is about the antiderivatives. Uh, this section is really important. I think it's very important for the next chapter. Okay? So you have to know the concept pretty well, and then you know how to do the antiderivatives once you are given a function. This will help you to succeed in chapter five. So let's give the definition, uh, antiderivative. So that means you're going back instead of doing the, doing the derivatives, you go backwards. Or another way you can call that, some other book also call this antiderivative, and they will call this um, is equivalent to say you're doing so-called um, indefinite integrals. So now what's the definition? Uh, a function of is called n antiderivative. When you put n, you don't put the, that means there are many antiderivatives. So a function capital F is called n antiderivative of little f on certain interval, you call that out, so n i. If the derivative of capital F is equal to little f for all of x. So to me, basically saying, you have the relationship. This is I like to use uh, to talk about this. So like the family tree, you have capital F is kind of the parents, right? So the derivative of the parents, that gives you little f, that's the, the child, the kid, right? So you go down like this way because little f is derived from that capital F. But when you go backwards, you are called F Capital F is the antiderivative of the parent of little f. So when you're going down this way, you do derivative. That's, and you go backwards, that's an antiderivative. And also, uh, this is only just between two generations, right? And you think about like family, you can go more than one, more than one generation, and you can go like this. You start with the capital F, the first generation, the kids will be little f. Then you keep going, you can go like f prime. f prime will be the derivative of little f. And you, and you can go to second order derivative, so on and so forth. Uh, then you can go backwards. So people will say, what's the antiderivative of f double prime? You go backwards, so you will have f prime is an antiderivative of f double prime. And also you can go backwards and you will say f is an antiderivative of f prime. And you can go just go backwards. So when you go back to the tree, you go to the ancestors, you do antiderivative. Pretty simple. For an example, you have a capital F of X equal to X um, cubed. And you have a little f of X, which is equal to three X squared. And you're talking about that interval I at, on the whole real lambda line. And you can see if you take the derivative of capital F, indeed you get three X squared is equal to little f at every X. So that's why you see X cubed is an antiderivative. of 3x squared, right? Now I want to briefly talk about the y, and we only call that a one antiderivative. Uh, do we have, like in this case, do we have another antiderivative 
for little f. So this question is like, do we have another antiderivative uh, of the little f of x, what I used in that example is 3x squared. Yes, actually we have many, not only just one, uh, a, little, a little more room here. For example, I can give you another guy called that f subscript one. I can add number one to that x cubed. And we know if you do the derivative of this new function, capital F one, and you're adding a constant, it doesn't matter, right? You take the derivative of that constant, you always got zero. You still get three x squared. So that means you can have another, another antiderivative. Once you understand this example, actually you can get a lot of, you can get x cubed plus c, where c is a constant. Those will be antiderivatives for that the little f three x squared. So in this case, people will say you have a family of antiderivatives. So you are call this guy if you have a family. So this is uh, something we actually learned by using the mean values, which you summarize um, from the following theorem. It's that uh, if you find, you have found one antiderivative, so if capital F is an antiderivative of little f on some interval i, then so-called the most general antiderivatives, that means the family of antiderivatives on i is just adding any constant capital C to that function capital F. Right? So, and then you see C is adding other constants. And the people call that the most the general antiderivative or it has the same meaning as what I call that the family of antiderivatives, just add constant C. Right. So we know the idea, we see this example. So now the big question is now, I'm giving, I um, will be give you any function little f. Can you find an antiderivative for that little f? Or can you find the whole family, the most of the general antiderivative of that f? And from the way we just did is, whenever you have a differentiation rule, you just go backward. You can't find the an, an antiderivative. So now let's see how can you find the antiderivative. So that's why the book has this kind of, um, Table, it shows uh, first, it lists a bunch of, of function. If you look at column three and four, or may, maybe column one to two, and uh, from the below, from here, you see this way, you go this way. That's the, that's the differentiation rule, right? So if you go this direction, you do differentiation. And now if you go just go backwards, you do the antiderivative. I call that anti, the an, an, anti-differentiation or you do integration. So that means if you can remember any, every differentiation rule, automatically you just go backwards, you get the anti-derivative. Uh, if you know, you take the derivative. Oh, I just, I did the backwards the table. Oops. Sorry. So we have to go this way. This way you do the derivative, okay? And you go backwards, that's the end, end head derivative. So, so this way, this way. So um, for one example, let me talk about this one. Since we know if you take the derivative of inverse tangent x, what you have is one over one plus x squared. So that's a differentiation rule, right? Automatically, this gives you the antiderivative. You go backwards, so that means you are say the antiderivative, antiderivatives of one plus one over one plus x squared is equal to this guy in that parenthesis. That's only one. You want to get a whole family of that. 
across the continents. Now the symbol, the notation to write down this is people find out um, every time I don't want to, I don't want to always write down the words antiderivative. So people invented a symbol for the antiderivative of this function is you write this symbol in that's the integral, right? Okay. The integral of one over one plus x squared. Then you put a little dx there. When you write something like this, so in mathematics, people will understand, oh, you're talking about the antiderivative. So the antiderivative. That's why we have a formula like this. So I think probably I want to go back to the previous page. I want to just uh, add a line to talk about the, uh, the symbol. Okay, so, so I will just put down this notation. Okay. When we write this symbol, uh, it's like a, the enlonged S, right? Summation stands for S. So when you write down this symbol, whatever little f of x there, and don't forget, you have to always put this little dx there, differential of x. This, the definition of that, colon equal, that's uh, most general antiderivatives. Uh, you don't have to say that words mostly general. You, we understand um, this is a family of DNA derivatives. So now with this, I can go back to talk about uh, this page two. And for example, if I look at this line here, how do I how do I interpret this? Okay, so this one. Um, I need more room. Move this down here. Let's do a do another example. Since we know we take the derivative of b to the x, you take the derivative. By the way, b is greater than zero. B is not equal to one. You take the derivative of this one. We know it's just b of x itself multiplied by the lecture log of b. Right. Okay. So now we just go backward. This is a differentiation rule. At the same time, it will produce, you just write the antiderivative of log b, bx, little dx. That gives you this function in that parenthesis. And we always add a constant c, just to emphasize on you have a family of the antiderivatives. And this is this uh, one here. And uh, you see something here, which is, what is this cosine h, sine h, okay? So this is something actually, and uh, to me, I think maybe it's a time for me to briefly talk about that function. And uh, this guy, and this one, they call that hyperbolic. Trig function have the body of the cosine function. So that's cosine h. And this guy will be called hyperbolic sine function. And where you can find the reference for this function, which I chose to skip because there's nothing new there is in section 3.11. So you want to look at that. Because this function is not really a new function, it's just a symbolically. What is the hyperbolic cosine function of x? This one just equal to uh, e to the x. Um, this one is a plus e to the minus x divided by two. And hyperbolic sine of x is just e to the x minus e to the negative x. Right. So this is just, actually it's nothing new, it's just like a exponential function. Okay. So that's why when you take the derivative of this hyperbolic 
cosine h of x. And what you have is e to the x on the top. And by the chain rule, you minus e to the minus x is this half. So when you do the derivative, you get sine of hyperbolic sine of h. So that's why you see on this line here, you have cos uh, cosine hyperbolic sine of h. You take the derivative, you get the sine. And the hyperbolic sine, you take the derivative, where you have hyperbolic the cosine function. So this is nothing new. If you want to know more about that, and you can read section 3.11. Okay, this is used a lot, I think, in physics. So I think the notation means this one. So once you have that, so we have a byproduct of the antiderivative. So you do the antiderivative of hyperbolic sine function. What you end up with a function inside that parenthesis is cosine, hyperbolic cosine plus constant. So that's why I kept saying, if you can remember every differentiation rule, you go backward, automatically it gives you the anti-differentiation. And another two things I did not talk about is the, the first two uh, is uh, this anti-derivative, it's kind of a, uh, it's a linear. So this one just means, if you say this one just means if you do the antiderivative, you multiply by a constant c. What you can do is you can just pull that c out. So you just take the antiderivative of that function f, you multiply by c, right? Just like a differentiation rule, you have a constant and multiple, you can pull that out. Another property, the second one is you want to do the antiderivative of the sum of two functions. And this will be equal to the sum of the antiderivatives. So you can break them, you can do that separately. This is really important, right? This can simplify our calculation a lot. Not only in plus, you can put a minus sign there. Put a minus sign, so it still works. However, there's no product rule there, okay? It's never ever do this. But this is just such a common mistake. Every time I taught this course, for the antiderivative of the product, never ever do this, all right? You cannot just take the antiderivative of one of that, multiply by the antiderivative of, the, of another one. Never ever do this. So that's the meaning about this, um, this table. So, and this is really important when we go to chapter five. In the future, you want to do the integral, definite integral. It's all based on antiderivative. And uh, in this um, semester, you're not allowed to use a note sheet, right? You have to memorize all this. That means, once again, chapter three, differentiation rule is really important because it, as the byproducts, it gives you how to do the, the antiderivative. All right, so now, it's time for us to do some um, calculation. By using the properties we just talked about, uh, and we find the most general antiderivative of a given function. And, uh, and also, uh, the book put this thing here, check your answer by differentiation. So how do I know I get the right antiderivative? Because you can always do the derivative, see if you can recover that, okay? Uh, so let's do this one. Uh, which one? I, how about let's do number, uh, number four is really simple. So find the antiderivative of this, number four. So a way I'm going to do that, maybe I will recommend you to do that is you write this symbol and put that your function six x to the fifth minus x to the fourth minus nine x squared. And you want to do the antiderivative. Don't forget, always put a little dx with that. Um, so, well, that requires some practice, okay? So by one of the properties we just talked about, you have like a three terms, right? First, you can break them. So you can, that means you can do the antiderivative of the first six x to the fifth. 
then minus the antiderivative of eight times x to the fourth dx, and then minus the antiderivative of nine x squared. Right? You want you can do that separately, and keep going. I can use that property. I have some constant. I can pull them out. So the first one I can pull six out. So that's just equal to the antiderivative of x to the fifth dx and minus eight times antiderivative of x to the fourth dx and the minus nine the antiderivative of x squared dx okay now here is something you have to be really good at that just add a few practice so i'm going to talk about this guy here this this symbol the power rule okay power rule so let me just uh, stop for this example, I will come back to this, and uh, I want to spend some time talk, uh, just talking about this. When n is not equal to one, the uh, negative one. So we have this thing here. Uh, we do the. I'm going to do that. Uh, if you do the derivative of x to the, uh, what's a good way to do that? Uh, Let's not talk about n is not equal to one. I, I, I just want to start with the power rule. So if you take the nth word x to the nth power, you do the derivative, you end up with n times x to the n minus one's power, right? So we know this. So that means uh, the power is decreased by one. Then uh, you bring the power up front, okay? So with this differentiation rule, what does that give you? You want to go backwards. So that means you want, if you're doing the antiderivative of the right hand side, and you will recover x to the nth power. Let's say it's one of the antiderivatives, right? Okay. And I don't add a constant to see at this moment. I'm just writing this. Because this is a constant, so you can divide both as by n. So this is what you have. Right. And now you can add a constant C here. Does that make sense? So that means you go backwards. You see when you go backwards to find the parents, it, you look at the power. The power is increased by one. Because originally when you do the differentiation, you decrease the power by one. But when you go backwards, right? So you have to, you reverse this process. So the inverse process will be you add one to your, to, to, to the power. And also you have to divide by the new power. You see what is one over n because, because that's the, the reciprocal of new power. So, so speaking another way, now if I change that, if I just give you the antiderivative of x to n's power, what will be the antiderivative? So according to what we just learned, so you need to increase the power, original power is m, you have to increase the power by one because you reverse that process. And also you need to divide by the power, the new power m plus one, and you add a constant c. Okay. Now there's one problem with this. This one, this whole process, it breaks down when m is equal to negative one. Why? Because when m equal to negative one, this thing goes to zero, right? So this one works. That's the only for m is not equal to negative one. Okay, so now let's try a few of them. If I do integration antiderivative of x squared, what will be the antiderivative of this one? So you are going to increase the power by one then multiply by the reciprocal of the new power. That's it. And the plus whatever constants. And you can do antiderivative of x to the minus 2.5. What will be the antiderivative? Well, you just increase the power by one. Then multiply by the reciprocal of the new power. That's it. pretty simple, right? Things breaks down when you get to what happens to x to the minus one's power. 
Now the whole thing breaks down because when you increase the power, you, you're doing this. So you have to think about a different, what's the, what's the antiderivative of this guy? So in order to get this, remember, we did this before. What's the, end of, what's the derivative of a ledger log of absolute value of x? You still remember that. And it's really important. You need to put absolute va value there. So this one will always get 1 over x, which is equal to x to a negative 1 power. Right? So this is the differentiation rule. So a byproduct of that is you do the antiderivative of 1 over x, or you do the antiderivative of x to the minus 1. What you get is this lecture log of x, this then plus a constant c. So this two, I think then maybe two of the most widely used anti-differentiation rules. And don't get confused, OK? The power rule, uh, it, it applies when the power is not equal to the form. So that goes to all the way up. You see this one, I just boxed. And the next one, just below that, this is uh, this is a really important. Yes. The antiderivative, the power rule here. Uh, what? Yeah, you, you whatever whatever antiderivative you got, you can always add add a constant c. That will just shows you have so many, so many antiderivatives. So the, the point for these questions about why do we add a constant C? Because your point is you want to include every, every function. It's, you're not just finding one and antiderivative, say x, plus, x cubed plus one. The kids of that will be three x squared. And also you have x cubed plus five take the derivative, you always get 3x squared. And you have x cubed minus 20, 20, always get that. So you add any constant c, you get the same function. Now people is asking you, tell me, find all of the functions whose derivative is equal to 3x squared. How will you write down the answer? You will say, okay, that's x cubed, right? And maybe you want to put in words, plus any, constant that covers every function, right? But instead of writing any constant, like in words, so mathematicians just write x cubed plus constant c. This covers everything. So that's the only purpose. Make sense? Yeah. So when you do the antiderivatives, and actually that's why I say in the first page, because of this theorem, theorem, you always add a constant c. Find one antiderivative. That's only one member of that family. You add, you add any arbitrary constant. You're generating all of the antiderivatives. So antiderivative is not unique. It's infinitely many. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, So where are we at? So we're talking about the general idea of how, uh, how to do the power rule, right? Let me fill in this box. Uh, we're going back to solve this number four. We stopped here and we're doing the antiderivative of these three terms. So I think it's the right place for us to apply uh, that rule. So first, what's the antiderivative of x to the fifth? So six will stay the same. So I'm going to increase the power of five by one. And now don't forget, you always want to multiply by the reciprocal of that power. The reason you want to do that because you want to check. See, if you take the derivative of this function, you do need that one six because when you do the derivative of the second one, you have an extra six coming down here, and that six cancelled with that six. That's how you recover x to the fifth, right? So it's important you have this constant there. So 
So what else should I write for this antiderivative? As we just talked about the antiderivative, right? You always want to add a constant. So you put a constant here. Now you go with the second one. So minus eight, what's the antiderivative when you see this symbol in words that means antiderivative of x to the fourth? And we know how to do that. It's the power increased by one, then multiply by the reciprocal of that power. And then you need to add a constant. Now you see there's a problem here. You have this two C. How do I differentiate them? How do I make it, you know, either they're two different constants. It might be the same, they might be different. See, I can add a one here, I can get a, add a five there. So mathematically, you want to show people those might be two different constants. You just put some subscript there. You put the, a, a label on that. So you can call this C sub one. This is a C sub two, that means just a different constant. Now you go the third minus nine, antiderivative of x squared, you know that's equal to x cubed, multiply by the reciprocal of that, and you are going to add another constant c, well, might be different, so you call that c sub three. Now we can just like distribute this. So six times one six, that's why you have x to the sixth power. The second one, you have six, Big C1. This, uh, now you distribute this part. You have 8 over 5 x to the fifth minus 8 C2. And the third one, you distribute that. You have minus 3 x cubed minus 9 C cubed. So I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to group these three uh, terms with variable x together. x to the sixth minus eight over five, x to the fifth minus three x cubed. Then group all the other constants together. Now take a look of this. What do you want to call this guy? Six C1 minus eight C2 minus nine C3. How can we call that term in you by just using a word? Well, I can just call that a constant, right? Whatever C1, C2, C3, whatever, how you're going to do the calculation, you will end up with a number. This is just whatever, it's just another constant. Does that make sense? Another constant is given them instead of writing the three terms, because there's another constant, why do why wouldn't I just call that C4, right? Well, I can also improve this. Instead of calling that C4, why do I have to use that extra subscript? You know, in a lot of times when you see the notation, the purpose in mathematics for the notation is a mathematician, they try to be lazy, right? Concise, they write write shortly. So why there's no point for writing that extra subscript for? For those three subscripts, you do need that. You want to tell people those are different. This is just another concept. Why wouldn't they just, just write, just erase that? When you have a big C that you say, well, this is another concept. Okay. Now, once you have, then we solve this problem and then we can check. We can check if we got this one right or not, okay? Here's the check process. How do I check whether I get a right and antiderivative? So I'm going to just do the derivative, see if I can recover the original function given there. So I do the derivative with this. The first one gives me six x to the fifth. The second one gives me five eighth times five x to the fourth minus nine x squared, this constant c gives me zero. So indeed, I do recover that one, right? So I know I get the right answer. Now, one more thing, I did that in a really tedious way. When you go back to check your solution process, 
you may you may be wondering why do I have to add a constant c1 at this step? Why do I have to add a constant c2 at this step? Why do I have to add a constant c3 at that step? Because eventually I have to distribute them, I have to combine them, and I have to call them another constant c. So I can improve my solution a little bit. I don't have to do this adding constant c in the intermediate step there. I just, whatever function I have, I just add a constant c in the end. This is what I meant, okay? So this is, so improve the solution, okay? So that's how I'm going to write this. So I do antiderivative of, uh, so what's the problem? Six X to the X minus eight X to the four uh, minus nine X squared. Excuse me. Do the antiderivative of, of this. And I can simply write down the antiderivative of this one as X to the six. Do not add a constant there. And this one, I have minus eight fifths x to the fifths. Don't add a constant here. And get this one as nine times, this is a three x cubed. Once I get this, I just add a constant, whatever. I just need to find the one end that you will do, then adding one constant. So this is much better than uh, what I just wrote, right? But I did that you know, on purpose. Just because in the past, when I just explained that, um, I, you only need to add the constant C in the end. The student always asked me why. Why you, you told us every time you do the end of the work, you want to add the constant. Why eventually you won't do that? I just illustrate because eventually you end up with this whole thing. It's just another constant. Um, any questions? Does that make sense? So let's do another one. So let's see, uh, looks like number, number 18 and 16. Let me just copy and paste this too. Okay. Uh, what's the good way to do that? Um, do two more. Number 16. So I'm going to just write down, I'm going to find n derivative of both seek in the theta, tangent the theta, minus two e to the theta. And don't forget, never ever forget, this means you are doing the n derivative. And now, now we know you can just break this as doing the n derivative of two functions. And by the way, once you have done a couple of, you know, problem, you practice a little, you know, this is a constant two, right? You can always pull that out. Just save one step, pull that two out, you do the end of the bit of e to the theta. Okay. Now here, it just depends on how familiar you are with the differentiation rule. Think about which function, if you take the derivative, you will get secant theta, tangent theta. If you're really good at the, the differentiation rules, then you realize this one is just simply secant theta, right? So basically it says the parent uh, you know, is, is secant theta. It's, I will think this way, the prime means you go down the family tree. You do this, the keys of secant theta is secant theta, tangent theta. When I do the antiderivative, I want to go backwards. So the parent of that one, that's just equal to secant theta. So you come up with antiderivative, the, sec the secant theta. And you don't have the other kind of C there, right? And this one, e to the theta, we know e to the theta, when you do the derivative, when you do the derivative, it will be itself. So when you go backwards, 
the you will have e to the thirty. So so and don't forget you need to multiply by two. You have two times e to the theta. You get a one antiderivative. Now you add a constant to c. That's it. So you get a family. You have all of the antiderivatives. All right. The next one, two cosine d minus three over square root of uh, uh, v squared. So number eighteen. We're doing the antiderivative of uh, two cosine d minus three over square root of one minus v squared dv. Again, we try to break that, and you have constant two. Pull that out. You have cosine v dv, and you have that three, and you pull that out. You have one over square root of one minus v square d. So now, whose derivative gives you cosine v? Sine, right? If you remember that sine, you take the derivative of that. That you get cosine v. Antiderivative is going backwards. So antiderivative of cosine v that's sine v times two, get this one. And now what about the other one? You have to be familiar with this one. You take the antiderivative, or you take the derivative of inverse sine, or another way to write that is arc sine. You take the derivative. We, we have done this before, right? The inverse sine function. So that means you go backwards. The parent of that one will be uh, inverse sine function. And don't forget, you need to multiply by three. And then you add a constant. So you, you just need to practice a few things. Uh, the next one, what we want to do is uh, differentiation. Differential equations. Well, the actual, the, uh, the actually, there's a whole uh, course, uh, math 3360. It's all the whole course is about ODE. Is a system uh, systematically you're going to study how to do the differential equations. So what is a differential equation? Uh, by the definition of that, um, a differential equation, a I just call that differential equation, is just an equation uh, that involves the derivative. The derivatives of a function of the unknown function. So basically, you just need to find the unknown in this time. Like what, what we did before is solving 3x plus 6. You solve this equation for x. This one you don't call that differential equation. This is just like so called algebraic. People call that algebraic that equation. So in this case, you have the unknown. It's just a number. It's just x. There's no derivatives of x there. Now, a differential equation, like this one, find a function f whose derivative, say, is equal to 3x squared. So now, this, in this case here, x, remember, x is not the unknown. It basically, uh, if you if you want to say that thing in words, that people will say, find a function, tell me a function whose derivative is equal to 3x squared. So the unknown here is function f is the unknown. That's what you want to find out. And by the way, when you look at this equation here, it's the unknown. You don't know what that f is. You have to solve that equation. And also, you see it involves the first order derivative of that. And there's some other things that people will say, find another differential equation. Tell me whose second order derivative is equal to e to the x. That's also a differential equation involving second order derivative. So there's a whole big research uh, sub area field or subject about differential equations. And in physics, in engineering has a lot of a lot of application. So that's the word we, we're going to just do the simple ones, like this case here. 
solving this type of differential equation. There's some other ones you can really hard, it's very hard for you to solve. And people will ask you, so find the differential equation whose second order derivative is equal to itself. That's another little bit harder differential equation. Can you tell me a function of that? Where the one of the function will be e to the x, right? And, and so all these kind of things. But we just need to do simple ones. So let's take a look. Finding a, an f is another way to say is a, uh, solving the differential equation. So we're doing this solving a differential equation. Okay. Um, let's do number, well, let's do number 26. Well, this is another one to finding F. If, if you also kind of think about the family tree is you try to find the ancestors. So it's kind of like, you know, say lemma 26, you know the second order derivative, you know the grandkid. What you need to figure out is you go back, you trace, find out information of the, the grandparents, right? You just want to go back. So what's the step to do that? So the idea is you do anti-derivative of second order derivative. So you first, you find out information of the parents first, right? Then this is step one. Then step two, you from the information, what you, uh, sorry, you don't have that anti-derivative. So you have f prime of x. Now once you know the information of the parent, then you go one step further, you trace back to get the information of the grandparent. So that's the whole idea. It depends on how many generations you have. So uh, uh, sometimes it's if people are given, if you are given the information about like 2020s uh, order derivative of f, how do you find the original function f? How will you do that? You just go back, you know, here is 20 times order derivative, you get just trace back generation after generation all the way to the first one. Does that make sense? Yeah. So next, once you understand this uh, procedure, let's just try to solve this. Um, X to the six minus four uh, X. Man, I just can't memorize these now. X to the six, second order derivative minus a four X to the four plus x plus one, right? So the, the idea to solve this is, okay, uh, first, I want to find the parent of that, first order derivative, by the definition, which is the parent, which is, means you do the antiderivative. So I'm doing the antiderivative of this function. That means I'm doing the antiderivative of x to the, six minus four x to the fourth plus x plus one. And now at this practice, I think we should be experts. Those are just a power in this, right? The first one, you go backwards, you reverse the process. So the power increased by one multiplied by the reciprocal of the new power. The other one is a constant, four stays there. This x to the fourth power increased by one multiplied by the reciprocal of the new power. The next one, what's the power here? It's x to the first, actually. So the power increased by one, you got two multiplied by the reciprocal of new power. Then what about that one here? One is actually x to the zero's power, right? So the power will increase by one, you get x to the first. Then you do the antiderivative of one, you get a one. So we don't have to write that. So the antiderivative of one is always just x. At this moment, you don't have to add a constant C yet. So you just want to just write down this function. Uh, oh, maybe you need to add a constant C, okay, C. So this is X, sorry, I, I took back what I said. You do need to add a constant C. Uh, one seven, X to the seventh power. Let me finish this real quick. Four fifths, X to the fifth plus a half X squared plus X plus C. Now we go one more step, secondly. 
So you want to go to find f of x, you want to do the n derivative of the result what you just find. So you do the n derivative of 1 7 x to the 7 minus 4 fifths x to the fifth plus a half x squared plus x plus c. You do the n derivative. I'm going to just rush to the end. So it's just like increase the power, you go backwards, you have 1 over 56 x to the 8. Now this one you have uh, 4 over 30 x to the 6 and you have 1 over 6 x to the 3rd plus 1 half x squared plus cx. And now you have another constant coming out here yeah, because you do n derivative, you want to call that c1. That is how we find f. So we're going to continue on that. There's a few more applications about this n derivative. And that's my plan for tomorrow. So finish that section 4.10 or 11, then move to section 5.1. So the rest of like two weeks, I try to finish chapter five. And if we have time, we're going to move to chapter six a little bit. All right, so that's all for today. Thank you.